the puzzle and eventually made their way to Altasi, and they were the Allied officers um, who were the first monuments men to, uh, to reach this historic location. Here you have Eisenhower at a different one of the mines examining the stolen art. Here you have the anthropology, so you can see this is the central panel, the adoration of the mystic land, the land is here. This is um, his facing, which a lot of you probably know what that is. It's a, it's a conservation technique to help protect art where the paint has begun to separate from the support to keep it in place. And this was added by the Nazi art restorers. And this is inside a salt mine. Here you can see the eave panel in the background. And this is a plane that was commissioned uh, to fly the Gandalfis back to Belgium. It was the very first work of art that the Allies sent back to its country of origin at the end of the war. There's a code to the story before I finish. So during the Second World War, long after the case was considered closed and the registered panel was considered lost, um, a conservator uh, and Belgian surrealist painter called Yves Bagerbeck began painting a copy of the registered panel. And this that we see here, and the version that you see in color in any art history book, is officially Vanderbeck's copy, and it is excellent. Um, he changed just a few things to make clear that this was his own. He added a ring to the finger of one of the riders. He put in a portrait of the Belgian King Leopold, um, where there wasn't one before. And he had one of the figures turned sideways, who before his face had been obscured by someone else's hat but otherwise it looked identical. He said that he had found a 17th century cover that he painted on, um, but he was an interesting fellow. In fact, um, he was renowned for restoring works of art to such an extent that there was more of his painting than there was original paintings. And restoration, um, which has been displaced um, by the term conservation was very different and really until after the Second World War, uh, restorers or conservators would have a very heavy hand in repainting to try to make a work look as complete as possible and they did little to document what they did to distinguish it from what the original artist did. Nowadays, if you try to mitigate damage, make sure um, art doesn't deteriorate further, but it, the artists and the conservators are very careful not to trick the viewer into thinking that what they did is actually the original work, and they would rather leave something alone than do something that, that is deceptive. Not the case with Jeff von der Beck. In fact, there was an exhibit um, in Belgium not long ago um, about forgeries and um, using von der Becken's uh, handiwork because he seems to have been a forger as well as a conservator. And that would become uh, a key point that I'll bring up just now. On the back of the copy, the replacement copy of the Righteous Judges panel, um, is a very odd um, quatrain in Flemish. If I can get to it, let's see. Here we are. You can see it. Um, and it says roughly, I did it for love and for duty, and to avenge myself, I borrowed from the dark side. And Mr. Van der Becker refused to comment on this, this quatrain that he added. Um, he never said anything uh, about it. He said he didn't know anything more about the righteous judge's death than anyone else who read the papers. Um, and he died without um, elaborating on this. In 1950, his copy of the panel was officially bought by the Belgian government and installed with the Ghent Altarpiece. So that, in official terms, is what you see if you go to Ghent today. Fast forward to 1974. A conservator called Jos Trotheim every year was charged with cleaning the Ghent altarpiece and making sure that it didn't deteriorate. And he had done this every year for decades. All of a sudden, he shows up in 1974 and he does a double take because it seems to him that within the last year, the Righteous Judges panel has aged by about 500 years. He seemed to think that he saw crackler, which you probably know is the spider web of cracking on a paint surface that happens when the support um, expands and contracts in humidity. That that matched all of the other panels, and that all of a sudden this looked like a 15th century panel, not one that had been painted uh, even 30 years ago. He called another conservator, who was a colleague who agreed, and they went to the bishopric, and the bishopric ran a series of tests and they announced, unfortunately, this is the copy. Uh, the mixture of animal glue and plaster that Van Eyck uses is distinct from the one used here. The panel is 17th century, not 15th century. Um, what a bummer. But they refused to release any of the scientific data about their inquiry, and they refused to speak to any journalist who had further questions. 
What some people think is that von der Becken was somehow a party to the 1934 theft, that when ransom negotiations failed, he decided to return the stolen panel to the altarpiece in an odd and surreptitious manner. We're not sure why he chose this method, um, but the theory is that he painted over the original altarpiece in a very thin layer of paint that in 30 years of exposure to light had faded just enough that the underpainting, which was in fact the original painting, was seen through. And that's the theory, and we don't know this has not been proven, but that's what a great deal of people around get to think. And the good news is that within the next few months, we should have an answer to at least that part of the question. Because right now, the Getty Conservation Institute is cleaning the Ghent altarpiece and restoring it for the first time in decades. Um, and when they publish their findings, we'll at least know the answer to that uh, remaining question. What we probably won't know are the intimate details of the 1934 theft, and if, in fact, as, as we believe this is not the original, but it is von der Becken's copy, then the original is still missing. There are two tantalizing clues uncovered by weekend detectives who took up the search after the police failed. Um, they interviewed Houdetier's wife, which, very oddly, the police had never thought to do. And they learned a couple of things. One is that Houdetier was absolutely obsessed with a series of novels by the French novelist Maurice Le Blanc. His most famous character is a gentleman art and jewel thief called Arsène Lupin, or Arsène Lupin. Um, and that his favorite book was called The Hollow Needle, and it was one of the adventures of Arsène Lupin. He seems to have modeled this crime exactly on this novel. And there are loads of connections between the plot of the novel and um, the way this crime is committed. And it seems clear that he was the mastermind, although he certainly would have had help, because he was a short, little, pudgy, fat guy who couldn't see very well in the dark. So it was probably not a good bet that he was able to carry a very hefty painting by himself and managed to not trip over the pews in a dark cathedral. Um, but still, officially, he was considered the only one on party to the crime. So uh, there's, a, there's a very strange, um, extant mystery that still needs to be solved related to this. But I think I would like to stop here. This was a very brief overview of the 13 crimes in which the Ghent Altarpiece was involved. Um, I hope it's been interesting for you. I hope you can see where my argument comes from in calling this not only the most frequently stolen work of art, but a candidate for the most influential painting and perhaps the most desired object in history. And I'd be very happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you for your time. Who has the first question for me? Be shy. Anybody? How long was your research on this, on this particular I worked on this book for about two years. But it's, um, I, I worked on multiple projects at once, so I'm not sure how much this would have been if I had only done that. Because I, I write both fiction and nonfiction, and I teach, and I, I have the responsibilities with ARCA. So I would guess probably about a year if I was doing only this project. And the research for this was, was particularly tricky. I wound up using more secondary sources than I would have liked because I was covering 600 years and so many different major historical events. Someone mentioned this painting is kind of like Forrest Gump. It keeps on appearing in major, uh, major historical events around Europe, um, and it's really the case that there's a tremendous amount of ground to cover. But it was fascinating to do. Yeah. You said that the uh, there's a portrait of Hubert.